So I would like to start uh, with reminding you a bit of uh, the different uh, um, lightning talks uh, that we heard before. Very inspiring. What I appreciated a lot was the fact that um, maybe, maybe I can take this out. Uh, all the different uh, uh, igniters uh, were able to make connections uh, with some other sessions. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Fabio Cerino uh, was talking about the experiments. We, we spoke about this uh, uh, yesterday, so it was a way to connect uh, with the previous discussion. Something uh, I, um, I will tell you what was uh, one of my favorite ideas that was emerging from uh, Fabio's talk. I am very interested in the idea that uh, we can use uh, or, or maybe the question of whether we can use uh, clocks can be false in terms of uh, resources, the resources in the terms of quantum information. What are the limitations and what would be the advantages of think about uh, clocks uh, as a resource? Well, we had Alex. Um, um, I, I didn't know about uh, uh, Wheeler's idea of uh, uh, radical uh, conservatorism. Uh, it's something that probably I, wanna, uh, I want to borrow in the future as well. Uh, I really like the idea of uh, taking very seriously the knowledge that we have on quantum mechanics, on quantum theory, and on general relativity, and uh, go towards the merging of the two, but keeping some uh, very strong, uh, a very strong hold on the fundamental things that we have understood. But then the question is, what is fundamental in what we have understood so far? Um, I also uh, enjoyed the uh, among. Let me just uh, highlight one more thing. Uh, the, of course, uh, uh, the importance of uh, defining uh, these relational partial observables. And the interesting, this need emerges both for uh, general relativity and for uh, uh, quantum mechanics. In the, especially taking a relational approach to quantum mechanics. Uh, so the, seems, the, the relational observables uh, seems to be a trade union between uh, these two frameworks. And uh, in doing so, in defining relational observables, so you need to make partitions uh, to divide systems into subsystems. And this brings us to the question of this afternoon, that is, uh, uh, in which sense uh, um, uh, quantum mechanics uh, is a threat for uh, uh, objectivity. So if we have uh, this uh, choice of uh, choosing different partitions, uh, choosing different observers, because making this partition is uh, amounts to uh, decide which are the um, uh, observables of my theory, and also amounts to decide what is the particular uh, uh, tensorial structure of my Hilbert space. So if, I, if this became a freedom of the theory, in which sense uh, uh, our uh, picture of reality is, is still uh, an objective one. Uh, then uh, um, uh, the two, I would say, local uh, uh, speakers, uh, our neighbor from Waterloo, uh, Doreen Fraser, uh, who brought the discussion from quantum mechanics into quantum field theory, I strongly believe that whatever interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, we will gonna agree upon, it should be an interpretation that takes into account the fact that the quantum theory is not just quantum mechanics, is quantum field theory, uh, I mean, at, at its best, it's enlarged to a, a, a relativistic um, uh, framework. So, and therefore all the questions that uh, uh, Doreen was uh, uh, raising, I, want to uh, highlight from uh, her talk the, um, the, um, the uh, stress upon uh, focusing on local measurements. Uh, and this uh, brings to my mind uh, uh, something about uh, different, uh, different uh, approaches uh, to, to quantum gravity. So, you know, uh, there are, if you want, there, there are two main schools, uh, the perturbative one and the non-perturbative one. On one side, the prominent uh, example are string theory, is string theory. On the other side, on the other camp, the prominent example is loop quantum gravity. There are many ways uh, to define uh, what, are, uh, uh, what is the difference between the, the two. Usually we say one is uh, uh, background dependent, the other is background independent. 
but uh, um, uh, one of uh, uh, the difference is also that on one side you have a community that focuses uh, on uh, um, asymptotic uh, uh, conditions. Uh, so we always uh, uh, consider observables that are at infinity. In, uh, in, in the way we do loop quantum gravity, uh, we instead focus uh, on finite region of space times. And, there, and being uh, loop quantum gravity, or whatever theory of quantum gravity you want to do, is a, a, it's um, quantum theory in which uh, you compute the transition amplitude. So these transition amplitudes uh, have uh, boundaries uh, on, a fine, uh, on a finite uh, uh, region. So this connects uh, uh, with uh, uh, the talk, uh, uh, the lightning talk, and the discussion that we will have on the last day about uh, what is uh, the uh, viable structure that we have to use uh, to do quantum gravity. So there will be a presentation uh, by uh, Adamantia uh, Zampelli about the boundary formalism. And uh, finally, uh, uh, with uh, Emily, uh, we came back. Uh, the, of course, it's the question of yesterday uh, about uh, uh, the uh, directionality of time. And um, again, the idea that uh, uh, the question, the big question of whether there is the need of uh, a fundamental uh, uh, time or whether time can be uh, perspectival and it could be uh, oriented and still be in uh, perspectival. So, okay, so these were, uh, it, this is a summary, of, I mean, a, 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 my own summary of what we have heard uh, uh, so far. Uh, I, I tried to, to connect with all the other discussions, but at the same time, uh, I want also to focus uh, now, uh, try to, uh, I'm, I'm supposed to be the conductor, so let me conduct you towards the way in which uh, uh, I see uh, this question of uh, how uh, um, we, we should uh, take the lessons from uh, um, what we know about space time, so from special relativity and general relativity into quantum mechanics. And of course, uh, from what I just said, one of the main uh, distinctions in this different, uh, 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 in the different ways in which people have addressed this question, this quest, I would say, is exactly in uh, trying to include special relativity, including the uh, Minkowski structure of space-time. So just going from, uh, quant uh, from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory, this is what uh, uh, Doreen was referring to. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, there is also this, uh, uh, I mean, we don't have just special relativity. Structure of space-time is best described by uh, a, by general relativity, in which we have to go beyond uh, Minkowski. So this first means uh, that um, so we don't just have a Minkowski space time, we can have uh, other uh, metrics. But most importantly, uh, space time itself uh, is a dynamical field. Uh, so we have to understand how the quantum mechanical fields uh, of matter interact uh, with this. Uh, quantum mechanical field that is uh, the gravitational field, that is space-time itself. Uh, so I think uh, now uh, I think I would like to, uh, to let the floor uh, to the discussion and, and the question. I, I see immediately Lee and Carlo raising their hands. So Lee was first even uh, during the, the uh, even during the talk. So. Lee first, uh, Carlo, and uh, Wolfgang. Hello. Very good. Thank you very much. The important points that I think we should keep in mind and which are the difference and which to me are necessary to succeed in this making a new theory, which is quantum mechanical and has something to do with space time, is to have the view first that the world doesn't consist of things that are, and the world doesn't consist of things that happen, that are seen to happen by other observables. The problem of local observables we propose to solve just by saying that the world is made up of events, and the events define the transition from something indefinite 
to something definite, and that will shortly become the transition, of course, from pure, from pure states to mixed states. And that structure, which I outlined, gives rise to a causal set of such that is a, a, a set with a causal structure, with a partial order structure, which throughout which energy and information are transferred from present events to future events, which are their progeny. And in that kind of picture, the, you, you want to ask what's real, what's definite, and what's local. And the combination of those are assigned to an event, and they are what we call the view of that event. And the view of the event is what's real, is what we call a beable, and is there's not a view. It's like the, the answer to that naive philosophy of mind problem of, is there an image of, an image of, an image of, an image of, in the brain, in the, the view of an event doesn't have, this is part of another view, which is part of another view, which is a part of another view. It is what exists, and which is equivalent to saying what happens. Now, from that point of view, if you ask about, for example, the measurement problem, you'll find that the measurement problem, but first, what is a measurement? A measurement is a comparison of two records which are in our past. One record is the record from the interaction that, produced the, that was the experiment that we designed. The other record is the computation in the theory that we're testing. And if you, and again, this is always tense, so you are always in the causal structure. And if you want to compare the predicted calculation with what happens in nature, they're always in the past both of them, and the past is always practical. So there's no issue about quantum, quantum states collapsing or something like that. So I don't, I don't want to go on and on and on and on, but I want to emphasize two things. One of them is that this is really developing a picture that was talked about by Freeman Dyson, by Heisenberg, and so forth. They, and that was what started us thinking. That is, they say in different places that there is no such thing as a quantum state of the past, and that quantum states are about expectations of the future. And so what we're trying to get you all interested in is the idea that to understand nature, including quantum physics, we have to see ourselves in a world that is tense, and where we are in it, that is, we are the present, the future has not happened, and is open, and the past did happen, and no longer exists. So, then the, so let me stop there, but my belief is that when you adopt this viewpoint, the structure of the quantum theory, that is how different kinds of information about energy and so forth are transformed and reproduced as the space-time causal sets grow is the same thing as space-time. They're not space-time and then the structures that make quantum mechanics. The structures that we talk about when we talk about space-time are exactly the same structures that we talk about when we talk about quantum physics. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos? Um, I am a radical conservative, but in the sense of John Wheeler, not Donald Trump. Um, I have two, two comments to, to offer. Um, one is a comment to Alex's presentation, and the second, uh, both to Alex's presentation to Doreen. Um, and they're the following. The first one is, is this. Um, I, I, Alex very usefully uh, started by presenting the, the, the famous postulate of quantum mechanics. Um, 
and then saying what, what, how, how they need to be changed to address uh, general relativistic situations. I think this is a good idea of, of, of thinking about physics. Uh, and I think it's important to always separate I don't know why we do science that like way, but we, it has been so successful. Separate the general structure of mechanics from the actual theory. So in quantum mechanics, we have a general structure of quantum mechanics whose postulates are, are good for, for all the quantum theories we have, whether it's QED, quantum field theory, where it's a harmonic oscillator, whether it's a, a, it's a free particle, whether it's a Josephson junction, whatever. So this is a general structure. And, um, and then the specific theory. Now the same is true in classical mechanics. Uh, there's been a lot of work for figuring out the general structure of classical mechanics. Again, you can do it in various ways, like in quantum mechanics also you can do various ways. Phase space, evolution, Hamiltonian, blah, blah. And then you have a specific theory. So solar system, Newtonian mechanics for particle, oscillator, and so on. Now, in this sense, I, I want to point out that um, General relativity forces us to change the way we think about uh, the general structure of quantum mechanics, but also forces us to uh, change the, the way we think the general st structure of classical mechanics. Because your talk could have been, um, which by the way, I agree everything you said, everything, this is, nothing what I'm saying is gonna uh, go against to the opposite. I'm sort of reinforcing your perspective. Um, but I wanna emphasize the fact that uh, three quarters of what you say has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. That's what I want to say. So if you um, ask what is the general structure of classical mechanics, and you write a postulate, you say I have phase space, I have observables on phase space, I have Hamiltonian evolution on phase space, and then I have observations, which don't change the state, but this is classical. And then you say, okay, I have all these theories, and then in 1915, we discovered, Einstein discovered general relativity, it worked so fantastically, oops, it doesn't fit in this scheme. So this scheme has to be updated, the classical one. And so how do you do it? Well, there is a way of doing it, to, to, to updating it. And so you have not to think about uh, um, the phase space, but you have to think about an extended phase space because your time variables get mixed with the others. You don't think about uh, dynamics given as evolution, but you have to think about dynamics in terms of relational variables. All this is classical. The, the classical analysis is classical general relativity. Um, this is the way I, and this is why my book Quantum, Quantum Gravity is written, my old 2014 book. So I, I do all this work for classical, for the general classical mechanics, and then you can do the work for general quantum mechanics. And one has to, um, in my opinion, go exactly in the direction you're saying, to extend the phase space, bring the, the time variable as on the equal footing with the other variables. Um, think at, evolu at the dynamics only in terms of evolution of specific va 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 variable, but in terms of relations between, uh, um, between uh, uh, observation and so on and so forth. So um, this is the first point I, I, I want to make. Definitely, general relativity has told us that this the, the, the evolution in time way um, of thinking of classical dynamics and quantum dynamic has to be updated and, and done better. And I think the direction we were discussing is, is, is the right one. The second point I want to I wanna make, which is related, and it's, it's also related to what Joey was saying, that when we, when we studied quantum mechanics at the beginning, those of us who studied well quantum mechanics, um, one thing we learned, if you remember where, that there are two pictures. This is Dirac book, uh, the way the Dirac terminology. The Schrodinger picture, the Heisenberg picture. Um, where this has nothing to do with wave mechanics versus matrix mechanics, has to do with how you treat time evolution. One way of treating time evolution is to say, uh, the whole Schrodinger picture, there's a state evolved with time, and then something happens at some time. Another way of uh, treating time evolution is that uh, what you call observables are labeled by parameter t. So there is a, a state space, which nothing evolved is there, but you have observables, at, uh, you have x at one time, x another time. Uh, it's well known that the two ways are equivalent. You can map into one another if there is 
the a time evolution as we thought about time evolution before general relativity. Um, in the moment in which you bring in general relativity, the Schrodinger picture doesn't, doesn't work anymore, and you're only left with the Heisenberg picture. Now, Dirac, allow me to say that, Dirac published the first version in his book with only the Heisenberg picture, uh, which he, his terminology was a relativistic version, um, and then in the third, second edition of his book, he changed and said, well, everybody's using the Schrodinger picture, so I also talk about that. It's really a pity because the other seems to be much more fundamental to my eyes. And Dirac, um, the, last, the last talk he gave in his life was old. It was in, in Italy, in Erice. I was not there, but a friend of mine was there. And he gave a talk with a single transparency, only one, in which the word Heisenberg equation of motion and uh, a, a single phrase, which was the Heisenberg picture is the right picture. Now, this is an argument by authority, but I think he was completely right. Once you go to general relativity, it's just the Schrodinger picture is not available anymore because they're not equivalent anymore now because you don't have a preferred time that goes from minus infinity. You don't have, you don't have a, rep a representation of R in the Hilbert space that allows you to go from the Heisenberg picture to the Schrodinger picture. And then this forces immediately to think differently a lot of questions, including all the questions that Doreen was putting on the table. Because if in uh, quantum field theory, this has nothing to do with GR, um, we think in terms of eyes and picture, which is how a lot of people doing, uh, I mean, people do perturbation theory work in this intermediate picture, the interaction picture, if you sort of understand, between the two. But it's very much Heisenberg like the interaction picture, because the state, there's no state evolving in time. So this means that the state is not localized in space time. The state has nothing to do with something living in space time. Space time is what you're describing is there, but the state is what you know about. It's not what, what is there. So this, the, I, 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 my, two, my two messages are first, um, half of the strange rewriting of quantum mechanics that we need for general relativity, it's exactly the strange rewriting of classical mechanics if you want to formulate um, general relativity as a one of the theories in general structure of mechanics. Uh, you have to rethink ge general structure of mechanics along with your, your, your favorite. And the second is that this is much easier if you stop thinking of uh, uh, quantum mechanics in the Schrodinger picture, it's evolving state, the state that changes and collapses and does that, and, and think in the eyes in the picture, uh, think simplifies a lot. And I think this is also very useful in going to quantum gravity. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, I see some hands uh, uh, coming up. Uh, I wanted to use uh, a signal in code that a finger is a continuation of the previous discussion and a full hand is a new topic. So I see a finger there. And Wolfgang, was it a new topic or a... Yours uh, was a new topic or a continuation of new topic, I, I, I guess. So first there and then that uh, as a continuation uh hello um yeah i couldn't agree more with carla um so hello. i couldn't agree more with with carla and what i'm surprised is to to listen this here because like uh, we we've been having like two days of conference and like so it's the first time that i hear reference to the heisenberg picture and, and its superiority, and we keep discussing the state, the state, and when we refer to the state, we don't refer to the updating of the observable as the state of a system, and we just take the get as a reference. So we keep discussing the state as the Schrodinger state, and I think this is a crucial mistake because so if you fix an ontology where you see the state as the evolution of the observable, you have much simplicity because uh, you have local observables, so therefore you have localization of your state. You have splitting of, of the state because you can derive any global state just in terms of the local subalgebras and, and their evolution. So I think we should focus on, on that and, and on those interpretations. Uh, Zach? Uh, yeah, so I want to follow up on um, Carlo's observation that uh, a lot of uh, 
Professor Smith's presentation could have been generalized to classical mechanics. Um, by pointing out a related issue kind of floating in the neighborhood of the issues uh, motivating Professor Smith here and a lot of us here, I think. Um, specifically, that has to do with spin states. Um, so uh, roughly, Professor Smith's proposal is that we're representing the state of a system A at time T as read by some physical system that is some laboratory clock, you might think, in more experimental context. And part of the motivation here is to rethink quantum mechanics in a background independent way, or at least in a way that's compatible with an ultimately background independent uh, theory of quantum gravity. Um, so without representing our states as living in this thick uh, background space time structure. Uh, and I think this is very well motivated and maybe it's worth drawing out the experimental side with a, uh, an observation made by Eugene Wigner in 1957. He was puzzling over the, this very issue of the use of background space-time structure and quantum mechanics on the one hand, but background independence and GR on the other, uh, in thinking about different group representations of special relativity. Uh, and he has a kind of very short section towards the end of this paper where he asks, how much do we actually use the absolute time concept in quantum mechanics? And from the perspective of the experimentalist, it's really not very much. So we might think that the, the independent variable in our theory is tracking something called absolute time when you're thinking about it as theorists. But what the experimentalist does is they uh, have some reading of some laboratory clock whereby they can now represent a given system in a determinate experimental arrangement. Um, Okay, so let's just so I'll play some uh, some some well motiv well motivated experimental sides of what Professor Smith was saying. But now I want to point out that there's still some background space time structure left over in the letter of the uh, proposal here, um, namely the Euclidean space part. So the time part gets this relational parsing, but the nature of what we're observing is still in quantum mechanics prima facie requiring something like Euclidean space to set up the meanings of orientable observables. And a really obvious interesting case here is precisely spin state. So um, to take the, the kind of classic textbook example, singlet state of two electrons, Alice and Bob get perfect anti-correlated measurement results when their devices are oriented in like manner. Um, so I think this raises the question that I just wanted to pose to you all. Um, should we rethink this part of quantum mechanics in a background independent way? And if so, how? And I guess an analogous question on the experimental side, just maybe put the experimental issues in connection with the theoretical issues. The question we should ask here is, do we actually use the Euclidean space concept in, in representing these spin states in practice? And uh, if so, or if not, where does that leave us with respect to uh, whether, and if so, how we should rethink this aspect of uh, quantum theory? Thank you. Thank you, Zach. I, I think I, uh, I see your point, but I, I think the directions in which we, we are going is really to get rid of all of these structures. So for instance, I see like, the proposal uh, that uh, Emily presented that, that directionality is uh, uh, in the process, uh, not in, in some uh, background structure. It seems to go in the opposite direction. And I think that even, even if there was a kind of a tension between uh, uh, Lee, uh, Emily's proposal and Lee's proposal, it seems to me that even Lee's point of view says exactly that uh, directionality and, uh, and or, or maybe by the, the structure of space time that emerges from the processes uh, rather than being already there. So Lee, you wanted to say something about this. Uh, the microphone is on? Just uh, a bit closer. Okay. The key difference between the kind of proposal that Carlo and other people have been proposing, which we see which we see as inside of the paradigm which comes from classical physics. And our proposal, here, let me just get that. Thank right you. 
the key difference is that Carlo and friends like to speak, and correct me if I'm wrong, Carlo, in generalities so that there are interactions, period, and any kind of interaction results in a relationship which results in information gained from one side about the other. We believe that an interaction, what, we, what Carlo ought to be doing, is speaking of what we call events rather than interactions. And events are one-sided necessarily. So they are the construction of something from something else, of something disorganized from something organized, and so forth. And these are basic categories and not related to statistical mechanics. And our claim is that when you correct the, form, the theories or frameworks that are trying to go very general, that you end up with causal time relationships in all those cases, and you get basically the structure that my colleagues and I have explored. Thank you, Lee. And Verena, continue. Uh, so I, I wanted to follow up on the back and forth between uh, Lee and Carlo and um, just um, think about the general like historical and philosophical issue of um, what do you do when you're in a time of revolution? This came up yesterday quite a bit, right? And so we know that we are looking for a radically new theory of some type. What kind of strategies can we use to get there? And so I wanted to point out that there's kind of two orthogonal issues that are being discussed here. Um, one is what Lee, I think, was just talking about. One important source of inspiration is, of course, we have to start from what we already have. And that gives us a certain picture of what exists in the world, right? And so uh, realist interpretations of the current theories are important sources of inspiration for um, coming up with new ideas for new proposals for, for new theoretical directions. The opposite side of that pole is more instrumentalist types of directions um, where, and we've also talked a lot about experimental work, right? So um, thinking about how you can um, come up with new theoretical proposals that it, are intended to recover the experimental results that we think are going to be robust. Um, so that's one axis, the kind of perpendicular axis would be the axis of concreteness versus abstractness or degrees of generality, which was what Carlo was just talking about a moment ago in, in I think, both of his comments. Um, so one thing, of course, that needs to happen to have successful physics is that you have concrete models of particular situations in the world, particular types of systems. You, have, you need QED, you need QCD, you need the standard model, you need very, and then you need to think about particular um, circumstances in which you apply those models. So obviously you need that concrete level to have any kind of experimental success or purchase on what's going on in the world. But then at the other side of that pole would be um, projects to uh, think more abstractly or in general terms about as many theories as we possibly can, right? So I was talking in great generality about, at an abstract level, about uh, quantum field theory. Um, but as Carlo was pointing out, let's get more general than that, right? And, and actually, I think this is a point of putting Carlo a little bit on the same page as uh, um, the kind of things Rob is thinking about, Rob Speckens and uh, Lucy and Hardy and, uh, and, and reconstruction kinds of projects, which share that idea that an important uh, source of inspiration is thinking it, trying to push and be as general as we can about what we've learned, which I think if we looked at, look at past theories, such as Carlo was mentioning classical mechanics, was not done with Newton, right? What happened in the next several hundred years involved the development of Lagrangian mechanics, analytical mechanics. That turned out to be really kind of important for doing quantum theory immediately after that, right? But that, that was a development that took a lot of mathematical work, took a lot of thinking in general terms about solving problems from electromagnetism and various uh, different uh, areas of classical physics. So the, the main point I wanted to make uh, was just that there's these two uh, different strategies for pursuing 
Uh, the next theory, um, of course, diversity is important and people should be pursuing both of those strategies, but that they're kind of orthogonal to each other, right? So there's different dimensions along which you can think of inspiration happening. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, Alex? Yeah, so I just wanted to respond to the, this question about spin, is that, um, you know, usually when we say spin up and set or something, we're making reference to some background Euclidean structure. But I just want to point to some work um, by Bartlett, Rudolph, and Speckens, and then this other paper by David Poulin, where you can now formulate these questions of spin in terms of a background independent structure by basically augmenting the spin you're interested in with another quantum system. It's going to serve as a reference frame and then averaging over, say, all orientations. And so you can construct um, sort of relational observables in this way that are very compatible with what, what I spoke about. So maybe we can talk a bit about uh, that after. The other thing is I just wanted to agree with Carlo that, yeah, we, you know, um, we have to generalize classical mechanics as well, too. And like you say in your book, I found it very striking where you go to a Hamiltonian description and you see immediately that, you know, these, what I think you call non-relativistic theories are a very special case of more general theory. So um, I should have said that. So that's why I'm very partial to starting with a Hamiltonian constraint because it sort of already takes into account that, that generality. Um, and then the question I had for, for Dorian um, was when it comes to measurement, um, and because you referenced Bush's works, which I, I'm a huge fan of, I think these are amazing. And he takes, he takes, I think, what would be a different view of what we would count as an observable, namely not just self-adjoint operators, but rather more generally positive operator value measures. And I think maybe the current like, ethos in the physics community is, well, okay, you can always just go to a bigger Hilbert space and dilate these things, and then you can get self-adjoint operators again. So I was just kind of wondering, is, do, you, do you believe in this church of the Hilbert space, or are you all right with accepting that genuine observables are positive operator valued measures, um, because with this more general notion of observable, you can do a lot more things, I think, in, as, as he describes. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on what is an observ what is the mathematical representation of an observable? Just a short comment from the ring, maybe? Yeah, thank you. That is an excellent question, um, which has a very long answer. But um, I think, um, I'll point you to um, the one of the things that's done in this new measurement theory that's recently been proposed by uh, by, by Pfister and Burke is to uh, parallel what Bush does for uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, but for AQFT, right? So you're working at the algebraic level. Um, and then later on, you could construct Hilbert spaces if you want, but the whole thing is done at the algebraic level. Um, so, um, so while there, the spirit and the like mathematical strategy writ large about how you think about measurement theory and how you represent probes and systems is similar, um, the mathematics is going to be different, right? So, um, and, and then there's a lot of, work you need to do in order to make sense of that. In so it's, you have an algebraic picture and then there's a kind of scattering picture that goes along with it. So, um, so I, will, I will point you to that, but the, the, I think the basic answer is, um, at least in, in that version of how you do measurement theory, is you, you um, have to get more abstract, right? And, and move to the, to, to the algebraic level. So you're not thinking in terms of like making larger Hilbert spaces. Final comment is, um, Traditionally, algebraic QFT has been done in terms of um, like C-star algebra is focusing on self-adjoint operators. But one of the other moves in this paper is to move to the more general context of um, a PLVM. Okay, well, one, I, I still think we're very, very far apart. And the idea that we are suggesting is that the answer to the question of what is an observable in a quantum theory of space-time is an internal observable, an observer or observable inside the space-time. And in particular, their the information on their backward light cone, which you can do some computation in some various kinds of rules and realize new with each other and so are candidates for being viewable. Our claim is that it's impossible to Back up. Leibniz tells us that every point of view is different. That's the point of the, his notion of variety. Every view is labeled not by some address, but by the view seen from there. That's the lesson of Leibniz. 
and the last no Julian Barber. And our, what we have done is constructed notions of what's observable, i.e. beables, which are labeled by what they are, which is views from the past using causal relations. So we solve the problem of who is isn't observable. We solve it for a real world where there are so much complexity that every the backward light cone where the view of every event is distinct from any other. And we get that the information that you want to be classical, i.e. commute with everything else, is, has those properties. Thank you. I want to go to Wolfgang at this point. Thank you, Nick. Hello. Thank you. Uh, I have two minor uh, uh, comments. So the first one um, about uh, the talk of Alexander. So I really appreciate it how you pointed out that um, bringing quantum theory and relativity together will really force us to uh, change all our uh, the, the, the fundamental notions of uh, that we have in quantum theory. But I uh, the axioms, if you wish. But I wonder if we have to go even further, because in a theory where there is no time, it seems to me that. Uh, the very notion of uh, probabilities or how we, how we make sense of probabilities will depend on, um, uh, uh, must be changed. Or, or, and this goes, in my opinion, also back to the discussion that we had yesterday, that uh, the Born rule kind of, and updating probabilities seems to, uh, 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 or, or speaking about probabilities in di this way makes us uh, wonder about the role of time and uh, or makes uh, seems to require uh, a no, uh, notion of time and I think we should try to make sense of our probabilities at a more primitive level perhaps not through a Bayesian uh, update rule but more like uh, a, for instance a frequentist approach but perhaps people that are more familiar about the uh, foundations of quantum mechanics can say more about that, and I would really be interested uh, in hearing uh, about that. Another uh, very minor uh, comment about what Carlos said. I actually, I don't really, uh, I had the same viewpoint that uh, Heisenberg and Schrodinger are, uh, uh, that uh, in, in, um, in a general relativistic theory, uh, the Heisenberg picture is the right one. But uh, now uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure anymore about that. And this will, uh, I think, lead us to the discussion tomorrow about symmetries. Because, uh, well, time evolution is generated by um, Hamiltonian. And in, in a relativistic theory, the Hamiltonian is a surface charge. And then it really doesn't really matter whether we put the evolution, if the burden is on the state, to evolve or the observables to evolve. So in any case, the, the important point is not which picture is the uh, right one, but whether we can, in which sense we can still, in, if there's a sense in which we can still make sense of uh, a Hamiltonian in, in, some, in some notion. And I think this is, um, uh, this is an interesting uh, question. But uh, the, uh, the, this, this should just be a side remark. So the, the, the important thing, I think, is to think a bit about probability. And maybe you could uh, comment on that. I would really love to hear about that. It was Alex. Yeah, so maybe I'll just say, I'll quote uh, DeWitt uh, from one of the Marcel Grossman conferences where he says that we have to learn that probability is something phenomenological. So instead of maybe starting with probability, maybe probability and like you said, it's intimately connected to time, like unitary evolution, it conserves probabilities in time, blah, blah, blah. So like, um, I think his sentiment was maybe that instead of starting with probability a priori, maybe it's kind of emerges when we have classical clocks or some sort of phenomenological thing. So maybe, yeah, so I agree with you that somehow probability is intimately connected to, to, to time in, in that way. That's all I wanted to say. Is it, is it a comment or a question or a new topic? No, no, there. Okay. Okay. 
Well, I only wanted to add that I, in some sense, disagree with what, what, what he said, because I think we do not reformulate to, we don't need to reformulate our, our definition of probabilities. The only, well, because probability, in some sense, um, is well defined. Even mathematically, is well defined. It's a special case of measurement theory with Borel sets, something like that. I think that the, what we need to do is to, to reformulate our, our interpretation of probabilities. Uh, general relativity forces us to, um, to for, reformulate our perspective as a, relational, as a more relational perspective. And I think we should reformulate our, our interpretation of probabilities as relational probabilities. And I, I, I think we do not uh, need to reformulate the way in which we assign probabilities. We need to reformulate our interpretation of the probabilities. And I'm sorry, I forgot my, the, the, the last comment I want to say, but I think that it's, it's the, the thing that we need to reconsider when we, when we um, trying to mix general relativity with quantum mechanics. Uh, but what I, what I think that we need to reconsider deeply is the way in which we assign geometry to, to our world, because there are studies that point to a deeper connection between the way we assign geometry to, uh, to the world with the objects that we consider to assign that geometry. I think we need to consider those studies deeply because um, uh, we usually do not uh, uh, pay too, uh, enough attention to the ways we consider that kind of thing. So I think we do not need to, to reformulate probabilities. We need to reformulate our interpretation. But what we need to reformulate is the way in which we assign geometry to the physical world. OK, thank you. I want to go to Patrick, who has been waiting for a while. <laughs> Sorry, Nick, is it a follow-up? Okay, okay, follow-up of Nick and then Patrick. So, yeah, I wanted to press a bit more on the question of probabilities, because this was something that sort of struck me. Um, I thought it was kind of a naive question. Um, maybe I was being sort of obtuse about what's going on. Um, I mean, it's all very well to sort of talk about reformulating probabilities. We've got to remember the cash value of these probabilities is the frequencies that one observes, you know, in you know, operations in the laboratory. That's got to be the sort of cash value of the probabilities, whatever you say. So, I mean, the way this kind of concern was coming out for me was, you know, so you have conditional probabilities, probability of, you know, A has value little a, you know, when T has value T. You know, the normal way one would sort of think that that means, well, what does it mean for that value to be taken? You know, one standard answer is that there's a measurement and they, you know, it reveals value A. But that's, of course, sort of suppressed in the formalism if that's what's, what's being meant. But thinking especially about getting geometry or getting time out of this kind of formalism, if we do mean something like, you know, this is the result of a, you know, of a measurement of, of some value, you know, of, of A while I'm measuring sort of time on some clock. Those are operations that are happening somewhere and at some time in space. So the, it's, I mean, that's my sort of naive take is it's very hard to see what those probabilities could even mean without already having time and space uh, built into, into it. Okay. So, okay, I'll let Carlo interject with the follow-up. Um, just a, a, a thing, a very sorry to answer your question. For, 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 for somebody who grows up in relativity, you measure your probability at some time, not in time, at some time. And the time in, in relativity is either a variable that you can change arbitrarily, you cannot measure, it doesn't mean anything, or it's a clock time, which is the one we use in our laboratory except the clock times go at different speed. So you have to say which clock you are referring to. So out of the many variables, you have to choose one and say probability when that particular variable had that particular. So what you said is not in any sense in contradiction with what Alex said. It's just the, 
if, if, you, if you fold in the information we have about the world uh, from experiments in the last century, which is that if you do take two clocks, you throw one in the air, you take them back in your hand, the two clocks indicate something different. So now is the probability at three o'clock for one or for the other? Oh, it's for that particular situation in which one has a value and the other has the other. So you cannot talk in terms of time because there's many times. So you have to choose one of many times and the choice is so arbitrary that you just say, I measure things one with respect to the other. So what, what you're saying is not in contradiction with the absence of time in the specific sense in which it is meant. When you go from a Schrodinger equation, which is one specific thing, to a Willard DeWitt equation, it's just a, 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 the, the, the quantum version of the well understood general relativistic way of thinking, which is you locate things not with respect to an absolute time, but with respect to values of things that you see around yourself. Emily. Um, yes, yeah, sort of in response to this exchange, um, I mean, I agree with Carlo that the, the, the temporal aspect is meant to be relational, and that's where we get this from. But I think there still is a bit of a problem with probabilities in the sense that the formalism in and of itself doesn't really make provision for you know, one measurement outcome to be selected. So it's not obvious from the formalism what the probabilities are supposed to be probabilities for. We just have a bunch of relational descriptions that don't necessarily get cashed out in an obvious way in terms of measurements that are actually performed by anything. So that's kind of a Perhaps you want to interpret that in, in, in an Everettian way, perhaps some, some other way, but there is sort of a story to be told there about what these probabilities refer to and how, how they get sort of operational meaning in terms of things we actually observe. Will you pass the, the microphone to Patrick? Uh, yeah, so I had a question actually for Alex uh, following that talk. So. And it's kind of related to the stuff that we saw earlier as well with, you know, thinking about tensor products and the role that they play and how we might have to modify our, our notions of how to use them properly. So typically we think of tensor products as playing the role of describing how we compose systems into larger composite systems, right? We know from Bob's talk yesterday that there's, you know, tensor products are a very general way of doing this or monoidal products are a very general way of doing this. And they play a very important role in quantum mechanics because that's also kind of the structure that we're able to use to articulate why things like entanglement are very interesting, uh, which seems to be quite salient to making sense of a lot of other issues in quantum foundations. So tensor products like structures seem really useful for describing how to decompose systems, but it's not necessarily obvious quite what they tell us about systems. So one thing you might say is if I've got a large Hilbert space and I can decompose it into a tensor product, then uh, what that tensor product is doing is encoding how I'm allocating degrees of freedom of the joint system onto individual subsystems. But then in this kind of uh, relational perspectival, or sorry, a perspective neutral framework that, that's been developed, uh, you see that when you kind of switch perspectives in a certain way, however we make sense of that, this tensor product structure is no longer respected in the appropriate sense. And my question is, how should we interpret this violation of the preservation of tensor product structure in particular? So one naive answer that I would put on the table that I don't necessarily take to be the right answer would be to say something like, if we take uh, this relational picture seriously, uh, and if we take tensor products to literally do this job in, in this particular way, then what happens is when we change perspectives, people looking at the world from different perspectives will disagree about how to allocate degrees of freedom to different physical subsystems. And that seems either deeply metaphysically relational or perhaps like a mistake. And, and I, I'm not going to make a commitment to either side of that or even if that's the right way to read it, but I'd be interested in your clarifying thoughts on that. Maybe I'll just say, so you started off by saying, what is the tensor product doing for us? It's giving us a rule to compose systems together, right? Um, but there's an alternative view that you might say that, no, the tensor product structure is observable induced. So that my algebra of observables of how I can interact with the system come first. And then if I choose those algebra of observables correctly, then I can get a tensor product structure. So the usual example would be something like LOCC, right? 
I have observables over here that I feel like I can interact with the system over here by itself, and I have observables over here that I can interact with the system, and these form a commuting subalgebra. And you can show that at the algebraic level that if you have commuting subalgebras, they can induce that notion of tensor product, and then it encodes, this is sort of what I was talking with Laurent, so maybe you want to follow up too, that, that, that notion of locality, of being able to interact with something here and here and have it commuting, that encodes what we would maybe say is spatially separated. But there's no, there's no reason why maybe I can interact with the system in a different way by making joint measurements or joint things, and that could induce a different tensor product structure. So the point is that, that tensor product structures are observable induced. I know because you mentioned the relational aspect is that when we go to these, these relational Dirac observables, you can have relational Dirac observables relative to different systems. And in that case, you're going to get different commuting subalgebras that might induce a different notion of tensor product. So I guess it's sort of maybe flipping um, uh, the framework is that we're not using the tensor product to compose systems, but rather that tensor product structure comes from the observables and the way we're allowed to interact with the system. Uh, I wanted to take a break. So if it is a follow-up, uh, I let uh, so Laurent and then we take a break. Yeah, no, I wanted to follow up on, on the remark of Alex and the, and the question. I think. Uh, uh, and also, it's, it's some, something that was part of the discussion the first day. People were really confused about locality, right? And, and so the thing is that there's a conflict in history. So up to now, before you deal with gravity, uh, when we talk about tensor product structure, uh, which is the composition system into subsystem, it's clearly tied up with the space-time structure, right? And we have been so used to that that we think it continues through. Now, the one, that, I mean, as, as Alexander was saying, when you, when you deal with quantum system, and especially when you deal with gravi gravity, you know, because of the presence of the constraints, and it will become more clear at the end, this, this connection is, is, um, is broken, okay? And that's where quantum gravity is really uh, very interesting, in fact. And there's something fundamentally new, is that this, this connection between the, the locality defined as locality in space-time. Let's say the locality in space-time, you can think of it as the locality of the tensor product of the matter field. The matter field interacts locally in space-time, there's no, there's no. So if you ignore gravity, if you ignore the soft graviton, especially the one we, don't, we never measure, the one that constantly measures us or connects us, but we never measure, then yeah, it looks like the, the tensor product structure, there's no Hamilton constraints and it's, it's locality. Now quantum gravity forces you to take into account the constraints and then you have a new notion of, let's say, quantum locality. And I'm not even sure, you know, philosophers need to tell me what is the proper name for, for the locality of space-time and the locality defined by the, the quantum system. And once you accept that, then uh, there is the phenomena you're saying and that Alexander is, is describing, and this is what we, with Lee we call relative locality. That is, the notion of locality is relative to the class of observer you, you're talking about. So let's say the usual notion of space-time locality is when you, you deny the existence of the graviton, you deny the existence of, of, and you just focus on massive observables. These ones are going to be local. But yeah, so uh, ultimately, I think there's a philosophical uh, issue and a mathematical issue to define, you know, this notion of relative locality in a, in a broader sense. Okay, this is, the discussion is heating up. Uh,
So please, Patrick, so that. Yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one quick, I guess, response to what was said that, that I would throw in to kind of revise part of the question that I had uh, originally. So Alex, you mentioned, like, we can take rather this kind of top-down approach, where rather than talking about tensor products as encoding how we allocate degrees of freedom to various subsystems, uh, we could instead look at it as being a description of how we kind of make sense and organize the observables in a way that helps us describe things in a very nice way. Uh, so a response to this that I would have is to say, okay, well, why, do, why would we want to do that? One thing that we might want to do is that by, if our algebra is separable in the right way, such that we get this induced tensor product structure, then that might be a way for us to say, okay, this is how we can kind of infer what the subsystems are, right? If, if, I, can see, if I can see the tensor product in the observables, then I, can have, then I can kind of sort of use that to motivate, at least for some purposes, an account of which things are my subsystems, namely those things which factor across the same uh, tensor product. And then the, the reply that I want to have to this is to say, well, if we're doing this over this kind of algebra of these relational observables, then they are necessarily relational in the sense that they are defined only with respect to a particular system. But now we already have a notion of a particular system in mind that we have to take from the start. And we can't extract the system to which things are relative merely from the factorization of the, the Hilbert space of its observables with respect to other systems. Or so, I, that seems to be plausible. So there seems to then be a disconnect of, on the one hand, requiring a primitive notion of system uh, that serves as my reference system. And then on the other hand, having this kind of top-down picture of inferring what the systems are from the tensor product structure induced by the algebra or something like that. So just yes. throwing that in to make everything more complicated still. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Daniel? Thank you. Uh, so I would like to add a remark on this discussion, uh, especially on this point that uh, uh, Patrick and Alexander have been making uh, and uh, want to hear your reaction. Uh, so I understand that uh, it's important to have these structures like tensor product for defining subsystems. And Alexander was bringing in uh, this notion of subalgebras. So uh, I, the technical remark is, uh, uh, if you have a system with its own Hilbert space, I can think of a subsystem operationally without uh, thinking of tensor product to start with, with as built into the system. Operationally as, uh, uh, I consider the set of measurements that I'm gonna do, and that defines the subsystem. So technically this is a subalgebra of the observables of the system. Now I understand that you are requiring something more and it's not clear to me uh, why you need it. So the technical part is, once I choose a subalgebra and define my subsystem in terms of what I measure, in terms of the subalgebra, then the rest of the system is uh, everything that commutes with what I have, the commutant, and in general, uh, there's an intersection between what I'm measuring and the commutant, there's a center. So if I build my subsystem in this way, then I don't get in general the structure of a tensor product. What I get uh, is a direct sum of tensor products and it seems to me that one can still do all of the physics and all of the notions of uh, speaking about entanglement, entanglement in presence of constraints, without ever needing this structure tensor product. So uh, do I understand correctly that for some reason you want a structure tensor product? And if yes, why? Uh, Bob? So, so I start from the point of view that all observable structure can be defined in a terms of the tensor structure, so the, you don't need to re, um, refer to any algebraic structure at any point. I mean, that's the sort of story I was talking about yesterday, and that you find in, um, in, in my book with Alex Kissinger. So now, so, so okay, so assuming that you can do everything in quantum mechanics with uh, tensor structure without any reference to algebra or anything like that, uh, tensor structure is of course tightly intertwined with causal structure and space-time structure in particular, uh, in that you can use the diagrams which you represent, for, for example, for quantum processes, you can interpret them as space-time causal diagrams. And then if you use, for example, the notion of uh, causality, which Lucian mentioned, uh, which originated in uh, Pavia, uh, then you can, like, uh, foliation invariance and then uh, relativistic convergence for free. So you basically get a lot of the property and those signaling, uh, maximum speed of light, you get this all for free. So you basically get uh, your fundamental principles of your relativistic structure just from like the structure from the processes themselves. 
Now, of course, as we also know by the work of uh, Okni and, and all the other people who work uh, on indefinite causal structure, once you go to a gravitational regime, you have to sort of weaken the idea of causal structure to the indefinite ones. And by analogy, you would then also have to weaken your notion of tensor structure to an indefinite one. But still, if you look at the work of uh, indefinite causal structure, the concept of causality is still very important to understanding everything and reasoning about things. And the same would then, of course, be true with tensor structure, because it's sort of part of the same package. Uh, now, I'm also convinced that even in the case of indefinite uh, tensor structure, you could still formulate everything in terms of tensor structure. These will not be the same type of tensor structures governing substances, but I'm thinking here about, for example, the work Alex Kissinger did with indefinite the causal structure, that it just still uses pure tensor structure to formulate all indefinite causal structure. Uh, so yes, anyway, I, I, just to say, I think tensor structure can be used all the way through without actually having to give it up. I'm 100% I'm convinced of that, having done the same, like over the past 20 years for quantum mechanics. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah, there is a follow-up. Uh, I would like to say that I agree with Eugenio about the fact that subalgebras are the natural thing to consider. So I think that we should not get too fixated on the tensor product per se. Uh, commuting algebras is, I think, the natural and more general thing. But also, I also wanted to comment about Alex's talk that, uh, you know, it seems to me that this um, consideration that somehow the, the fact that we need to talk about relational observables, which is obvious. Um, it somehow implies that we need to reconsider, let's say, the tensor product structure. I think it's taking it a little bit too far somehow. Uh, I, I, I could not, in, it, I mean, it, it seems to me that it's a, it's a bit of an overstatement, really, to, to, to say that we must renounce the way we compose systems. Um, I do not find a sufficiently strong, uh, I mean, the kind of, uh, justification for that conclusion out of just the requirement that we should be dealing with relative systems. I mean, of course, relative systems are different depending on relative to whom they are defined. That's normal. But still, we have the tensor product uh, structure, and I think one could fully account for that in the framework of, uh, let's say, the Google or Butler. I think, for, for instance. Uh, maybe you can comment on that because uh, uh, it, it seems to me that maybe some of these conclusions are right because you take this approach to dealing with symmetries which is based on the projector, which is kind of the coherent twirling approach, at least in the context of time. That's what you kind of did with the page router. But you, I also know you are well aware of the fact that, I mean, that you mentioned yourself, there is a, uh, you, you can define this uh, invariant algebra by means of the incoherent twirl. Yes. There, it seems to me that to say that we need to renounce the fundamental ways of talking about different mm -hmm. subsystems. Right. So, I mean, I guess sort of being, to reply first, there's the being conservative and trying to follow Dirac in his quantization procedure by demanding that our physical states are annihilated by the constraint. You need to introduce a new Hilbert space structure on that solution space of, of that. And that solution space doesn't come equipped a priori with the tensor product structure. And so, the, so from my perspective, the task is now, how do we introduce a notion of subsystem on that physical Hilbert space? Um, and so one way to do it, exactly like you were saying, and then as, as you mentioned in terms of algebras, right, um, is, is to look at commuting subalgebras of, of observables to give a notion of subsystem. So I'm not sure if that's, if that's a, a reply or if that's satisfactory to you, but it's just the point is that when you, when you introduce constraints, you no longer, that, that Hilbert space you're constructing no longer comes equipped with, with a notion of subsystem. Um, yeah. I guess you need to define which, uh, I mean, there must be a reason to select observables and out of them to get there. But right. I feel that also the way of implementing constraints is potentially questionable. I mean, it's just postulated by a famous person, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, so maybe you want to twirl things instead or something yes. like this. Yeah, no, and I agree. And uh, that's something I want to think about too is, um, is maybe instead of projecting, maybe twirling over states instead and what more general theory might you get mm -hmm. in that sense. So um, I just wanted to also respond quickly to Patrick about, yeah, so you were saying um, 
I guess the point is maybe just that subsystems are relative to the set of relational Dirac observables that you're interested in, in using. So I guess, I, I don't know if that, that kind of addresses it. But then I just want to point out that there's some more general work on talking about subsystems and entanglement and all of that without even a tensor product structure and just at the algebraic level. And I have in particular the work of uh, Howard Barnum and Lorenzo Viola in mind on generalized entanglement, they call it. So they wrote some very nice papers in the early 2000s where they, they don't even use Hilbert space, they use convex cones and other sorts of things. So um, yeah, I, I agree with, with what you're saying. It was important for us to sort of recover the usual familiar notion of tensor product that we're all familiar with and, and, and know how to talk about subsystems and entanglement. So that's there is a comment by Elise. Very quick. Could the notion of energy be useful to you in the use of subsystems in defining physical systems? That is, I'm surprised that I don't hear discussion of energy, Hamiltonian, et cetera, which as a physicist is what I'm always referring to when I discuss the possible sense of other structures, who can be a bound state and not and so forth. Yes, go. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks for this discussion. It's been very interesting. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, the distinction between um, tensor products as describing fundamental structures in, in, in reality and, uh, some, and, and the constraints on the tensor products that might describe physically relevant scenarios. Um, so some recent work uh, in quantum causal models and, and other similar fields, um, we can see that a tensor product structure, as, as Bob said, really can describe nature at the fundamental level, but it might not describe the physical scenarios of interest that we, we're always interested in. So, for example, if we think about an interferometer, um, we can imagine that sending a single particle in a superposition of going to the, the left path and, and the right path. And so then, uh, then of course, the, the physical system on, on the interferometer, on the left and the right path, can be described, if you like, by the tensor product of, of the, the Fox space on the left and the Fox space on the right. But, but because we have started with the constraint of having just a single particle, then of course the actual physically admissible Hilbert space is no longer given by the tensor product. It's given by the direct sum. In fact, it's given by a direct sum of two tensor products, a tensor product of the single particle Hilbert space on the left, tensor the vacuum on the right, and the vice versa. So I think that, that this structure is something that arises very very interestingly, in, in, um, in, in this um, literature on coherent control of, of quantum channels and, and its extension to coherent control of causal orders, um, and, and uh, also arises in, in quantum causal models, which is related. So I just wanted to, to, to um, make this point, and, and maybe some people in, um, on the gravity side might have some, some idea. If, if, I want to understand if, if what people are talking about on the gravity side and in space-time is somehow related. Uh, related to this point, um, and yeah, so, yes. well, yeah. Thank you. I think this is very important in the sense that, so thinking about the um, the product structure, uh, first of all, I think uh, there are different ideas. So some people want the uh, product structure to be emergent, uh, given by some uh, fundamental principles. It seems to me that we have to see it uh, as uh, something that depends uh, on the particular well, our perspective uh, of the given experiment, the given observation uh, that we want to do. So it's operational somehow. Uh, the tensor product structure is equivalent to giving the observables of your theory and vice versa. If you choose your, so when you give uh, what is your quantum theory, you give the Hilbert space, uh, you give uh, some dynamics, but most importantly, you need also an algebra observable. So, so this is an input you put in the theory and giving this is exactly equivalent giving so you give the algebra observable so you give the TPS it's exactly the same thing so um, uh, so yeah I think there is very interesting uh, point that you were making uh, Carlo you wanted to comment on this and then there is another comment there yeah a comment on this what you said is obviously right and uh, in, in, in the context of so, let me say standard quantum mechanics I mean, so you're meeting the distinction um, with uh, so the fundamental constituents, let's use this way, where we, 
we know what uh, they, they, they're born in our theory with a tensor structure, but then we, um, we, we construct particular situations in which uh, they're constrained such that um, uh, the tensor structure gets um, uh, mixed up and you make an example. Now, what happened in, in any theory which is general covariant, it's not general relativity, any theory with general covariant, including uh, general relativity plus the standard model plus whatever you think. Um, so whatever sort of a good part of modern theoretical physics thinks is the world is, is what Alex was saying. So um, the, 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 there is a, um, the dynamics given a constraint. And one way of implementing that, and I think all the others are, uh, are equivalent. So, again, you say, well, that's not well defined, but that's well defined. I don't see any other way of defining it, unless one like um, uh, unless one picks at a Hamiltonian, a boundary Hamiltonian. Uh, but that's it. Seems to me is not understanding the theory. As far as we know, the universe could be compact, and that's not. I mean, we we have to understand the theory locally, not globally. This time. So the general structure is that instead of the Schrodinger equation, you have a we live with equation. That's one way of putting it. You have a, you have, you have a constraint instead of a, um, of an evolution equation. And as soon as you have a you have a constraint, uh, the the so-called uh, fundamental um, set of variable with their uh, with their tensor structure is not the thing you see in a sense. Because what you see is the Dirac observable in, in, in a sense. And, and so that's what happened all the problems. And, and, and formally, this is not something so abstract after all, because uh, we heard the example of the three particles in Flaminia talk, in which you, um, you sort of, if, if you don't see the center of mass of the three particle, you use two variables. And if you use the position relative to one variable or position relative to other variables, this is an example of uh, a it changes the tensor structure in the physical in the space. It's a very concrete, very concrete thing. Except that this is general in any general covariant theory of the world. Now, one way of thinking about that, which I don't think is a bad way of thinking about that, is to take the unconstrained Hilbert space more seriously, the extended Hilbert space, more seriously than what we usually do. Uh, namely, uh, 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 of course, we 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 dynamics is about the relational observables, not about the partial observable themselves. But there is a sense in which we measure the partial observable themselves, right? We we measure the clock value and the and the position of the particle in in, in your example, and then what the dynamic tell us is neither one nor the other one is one at the value of the other one. But there is a sense in which we can imagine, we can describe the physics as um, somebody external that cannot predict the partial observable, but can measure the partial observable in some sense. So one one way that's what I was pointing out. One way um, of uh, of thinking about generativistic system is sort of uh, not focusing on the physical Hilbert space, focusing on the extended Hilbert space. And use the physical Hilbert space as a, as, as a way for giving transition amplitude and so predictions, probabilities about relations between partial observables, and that simplifies this uh, this issue of what is a tensor product that is natural, because now it's in terms of the of, of the partial observables, which are the things that are uh, we we define the theory with to, to, to start with, and I'm coming more and more close to this, this perspective on, on quantum theory. So the, the good object to talk about, the, what, what to attach our interpretation to, it could be the partial observable themselves. We're well, being well aware that what the dynamics about is a relation and not, not themselves. So there is a comment behind you, Carl, if you can pass the microphone. Uh, and then uh, so be first and then Hal. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of respond to Lee's point about the importance of energy for defining subsystems. So I think it's definitely the case. There's research programs where the Hamiltonian will kind of suggest a natural tensor factorization to subsystems. So you can think of like in certain factorizations of the Hilbert space, the Hamiltonian will look like kind of like 
nearest neighbor interactions, for instance, they'll be more natural. And if you change the factorization, it'll be like massively non-local, for instance. So yeah, I think so. This kind of in the many worlds approach, for instance, as well, where they look at this. Like I start with a global wave function of Hamiltonian, no other structure. What can I infer? There are definitely certain factorizations which will be more natural than others. So yeah, I do agree that energy in the Hamiltonian can have an important role to play in this defining subsystem. The comments. I wanted to open another line of conversation connecting uh, to Fabio's and to Emily's talks and to the question that Doreen was asking about what kind of generalization is it that we're looking for with quantum gravity. So one way to phrase the question provocatively would be to ask whether we think that quantum gravity is going to include superpositions of space-times. Because it strikes me that if we allow for superpositions of space-times, then the, the light cone won't necessarily agree uh, in those two space-times. And there's something intriguing and unusual about the causal structure that should come out of that. So uh, I see a, a, a tension between... Uh, so I, I very much value this causal inference picture. It seems like it really does the things that people have been describing over the last two days, that is, to help us separate out questions of inference from questions of causality. But it has built into it very strongly the, the partial order that Emily was talking about, the, the directionality of the causal flows, which it seems to me like superpositions of space-times may not have so strongly built into them. And so I'm, I'm very curious what people think about that question, what they think about what it means to relax and generalize our notions of causality so that they can be more fluid. Emily? I wanted to add to that that um, the kind of kinds of arguments that I was discussing with, with regards to things needing to have a well-defined order really apply only to signaling processes. Um, and therefore, there's no need to, there's no need based on this kind of reasoning, for there to be any well-defined order for non-signaling processes uh, like quantum entanglement, which is indeed is what we, we observe. You can do your um, entanglement measurements wherever you like in space-time. The order doesn't matter. You can create loops with them if you like. You won't get contradictions. And I think what that means is that, for me, it's a mistake to try to apply causal reasoning at all to those kinds of correlations, because for me, causal, causal, causality comes from this well-defined order plus the addition of a perspective. So you shouldn't expect to be able to give a causal account of these kinds of correlations, which don't need to fit into this kind of order. Um, so I would, I would confine my causal reasoning personally to these kinds of signaling processes and, and keep it away from non-signaling non quantum entanglement. Can you please pass the microphone to Lucien? Uh, hi, yeah, just to address uh, Andrew Powell's question over there. Um, so, um, which is something I thought about uh, a lot, uh, the problem of um, how to deal with indefinite causal structure. So what one approach is to try to rethink um, fundamentally what kinds of frameworks you would use for indefinite uh, causal structure at all. And so one approach I, I worked on many years ago was to sort of re rethink how you do probability theory in the context of indefinite causal structure, uh, where you're not assuming uh, definite uh, space-like or, or time-like uh, intervals. Uh, and that's quite challenging because um, you know, a lot of the way we think about physics is in terms of a state evolving in time. Things happening in, uh, in, with def definite spatial and temporal relationships with one another. Um, and then an another approach, um, especially thinking about superpositions of different um, space-times, uh, is, is something I call the, the quantum equivalence principle. Um, and the idea there is, um, is that you can try to remove indefinite causal structure uh, locally, um, uh, like in the local vicinity of some, of some point. Uh, and uh, the, the way to do that is, um, is to um, sort of invent a concept of quantum coordinate systems. Um, so just as in general relativity, Einstein's equivalence principle uh, says that you can um, always find a, a um, coordinate system in the vicinity of any point such that um, you have inertial behavior. Um, 
uh, the proposed uh, uh, idea is that you would, the quantum equivalence principle I'm proposing is that you would always be able to find a um, quantum coordinate system such that in the vicinity of any point, you have well-defined causal structure. Um, uh, and of course, in the case of inertial behavior, uh, you know, uh, Einstein was able to leverage that to build his uh, field equations. Uh, and so perhaps by having definite causal structure in the vicinity of a point, uh, even if you don't have it globally, you would be able to leverage uh, that. And so, so, so there's a lot of freedom in these, um, these ideas of um, quantum reference frames going back to Haranov and, and uh, worked on uh, more recently by many of the people who are, who are, are here. Um, uh, and, and then the, the idea of a quantum coordinate system is, is a sort of a development of, of that idea. So that, that's, that's a comment on that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I try to, there is uneasiness with this concept uh, which I, I can sh share and I think very often is, um, I mean I can understand, not share, sorry, but it's very often identified that, um, in, or misunderstood, that the roles of the cause and effect are reversed in this kind of superposition of causal orders, which is not the case. Simply by definition, we say that the cause is something which may influence the effect, not the other way around. And the way how you can understand that is that you have two events or two operations or CP maps, but A and B, and that you don't know which is the cause and the effect. This is a, sim this is a different thing than having a superposition between cause and effect and in, inverted the roles of the cause and effect, which doesn't make sense in the first place. So you, you need then into space times to identify the same events, the same event A in the two space times and the same event B in the two space times. And then you can have a situation in which you don't know what's the cause and effect. So in one space time, it could be that A causes B and the other one is B causes A. And, but this is um, very similar like in any superposition in a double slit experiment, we simply don't know which path the particle took, not, not more than that. I just want to, um, this is the question that I think people are not, about indefinite causal orders. Uh, until we have a concrete quantum gravitational model coming from quantum gravity, where you actually have a notion of indefinite causal orders, is always speculation, right? And I think my understanding is that it doesn't come by necessity from quantum gravity that you have indefinite causal orders. It doesn't follow from the, the current quantum gravitational model, model that we have in indefinite causal orders. Is it right? So this is really important for the debate, otherwise we are talking just in speculations, uh, so yeah. So until we have a concrete quantum gravitational model of the different theories of quantum gravity where we have this indefiniteness, this is a little bit fuzzy, a little bit, yeah. Just to... Uh, I saw before a comment, Marius wanted to say something? Okay, then uh, Flaminia in this case. Uh, so uh, can you bring the microphone there? Okay, thanks. So I just wanted to add to what Chaslov has said so far, it's that um, so the indefinite causal structures, and I, I would like to relate them to the change of quantum reference frame that Lucien was also talking about, and to the possibility of defining locally uh, a frame that is uh, locally Minkowskian, even when you have a superposition of space times or a superposition of coordinate systems, as Lucien mentioned. And um, so you have to make a distinction between what happens locally and what happens globally. So you can have cases in which even though locally everything flows naturally and uh, nothing is in a superposition and you can reduce to Minkowski, then if you started with a situation in which the causal relations were indefinite, so for instance we have the example of the gravitational uh, switch, then even when you reduce locally to a situation in which you cannot distinguish if the mass is on the left or on the right, for instance, still uh, the causal relation mean in, in terms of 
signals that have been sent from A to B, this still stays indefinite. And so there are these two levels that you, you need to take into account. Two comments, uh, one in response to what you said, Francisco, because I, I completely, I'm very sensitive to your point, but uh, that's partly why I introduced the quantum tetrahedron on Monday. It, not that I think that it's a perfect model for these things that we're discussing, but it's at least an interesting test case where we can look and see a quantum geometry that starts out with a Euclidean signature metric the tunnels to a Lorentzian, it's a concrete example of the sort of thing that we're talking about. And so that, that's partly what makes me ask the question. Uh, to Chaslov and, and Flaminia, I, I, I'm, I really like that response. Like, okay, we don't know, but that doesn't seem to be what we're encoding in these directed acyclic graphs. That's what the sensitivity that I'm having. I find them very interesting for sorting out inferential and causal questions, but we're not currently allowing for one of our models in one branch to have a causal arrow and in the other one to not because we don't know. So I think there's, a, there's an interesting opportunity to look at a broader framework or a different way of saying it is not necessarily that you place the arrow or remove the arrow, but that what you identified as subsystems, you know, what you identified as the pieces of your directed acyclic graph, the nodes that you're connecting, well, in a superposition, maybe it's not so obvious that you can use those same nodes. That maybe the relata, Francisco was making this point yesterday, maybe the relata are difficult to identify, and so then it's difficult to write the graph down. Uh, and so I think. I, what I want to see is a slightly more flexible framework. Okay, maybe uh, Ozinan there. Okay. Hello. Uh, I'd like to mention that actually, uh, I mean, the, the framework of quantum causal models, which is standardly formulated in terms of directed acyclic graphs, can be extended, and we have done that together with um, Robin Lawrence and Jonathan Barrett to uh, cyclic causal models, and those are able to um, at least describe situations such as the gravitational switch that was mentioned. So it seems to offer a kind of a suitable framework, but then the, uh, again the question about relata is very important. What are the systems that we relate to? And um, yeah, th these are the important questions. Yeah, yeah, I just want to follow up. Um, when I said we don't know, I, I thought fundamentally we don't know whether A influence B or B influence B. Just like we fundamentally don't know whether the electron goes through left or the right slit. Not that we have an ignorance about whether it went through. And that's a real superposition. And in each of these branches, you do have a signaling. It's not one, it's a, it's a not order thing because they are superposition of different orders and in each of these branch you have a signaling so you have a directionality of the flow of information from A to B or to or B to A and um, you just need to recombine them to erase any information about this order to have this interference so it's a very um, quantitative sense uh, information flow in two directions in a superposition. So, Carlo wants to interject at this point. There's a question, Chasper. This is something maybe has come out before. In this, in this, if you have these two branches, what exactly allows you to identify what you call A in one branch with what you call A in the other branch? And this is also perhaps related to something that uh, uh, both Flaminia and uh, uh, Lucien was saying, um, you talk about superposition of coordinate system, but what is a coordinate system in a general relativistic context? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't even know what coordinate system in a classical general relativistic context. It's not something I can superimpose. So, so let, me, let me just split the two things. So, yeah, I, I leave them the others. Uh, so in very, in very similar sense, in, as in GR, what is the point? It's a material point, physical point, or coincidence. So 
or in a abstract quantum theory, it's a, what we call complete positive map. So it's a, the same thing in this point, and from the log point of view, is the same action. So if you really identify yourself with A, at the small laboratory, Alice, there was no way Alice can ever distinguish whether is B before or after it. But, is, we, that but is, within, this is not a measurement, right? It's within the story. It's a, it's, a, it's a measurement or CP map, it's a unitary, whatever operation it is, which defines the event itself. Also, I'm, I'm, just one, one question. You have a superposition of two things, two, two, two branches. Let me use this uh, language. One A happened first and one B happened first. But this is within a branch. So, and the branch goes from one measurement to the other measurement. So, it's not, uh, I'm, I'm separating the things that happen between measurement from the things that happen at measurement. Is that, is that a superposition of two different stories in which people do different measurements? Or if it's within a single preparation measurement and in between there's a, the, 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 the two branches in which the order between two events differs? It could, it can have a common preparation like a gravitational switch, you start with a large planet, localized, then you send through the beam splitter, um, and then you bring this mass in the superposition. Yeah. Then you do, then you have a two laboratories that exchange systems in a superposition of orders, and then you bring the large mass again in a beam splitter to erase any information about the order. Oh, so, so this is so a beginner friend situation in which you have one laboratory which is treated as a quantum system by another one. Each laboratory is treated. Yeah. By, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Mario, Carlo, can you please pass the microphone to me? Um, okay. So I I don't have uh, much work in the quantum causality, but having discussed uh, these things coming from the quantum gravity community, maybe I could uh, help a bit in this discussion. Um, so, first of all, to validate the point that I think is out there, and I think it should be discussed that uh, uh, people in the quantum gravity community, I think, are not convinced that the quantum causality has anything to do with quantum gravity. And uh, I think, indeed, it hasn't been clearly argued. People are going around uh, uh, a few things. Um, I'll tell you why I think that maybe there is something. And uh, all right, one thing we have to keep in mind is that uh, it, it's a very different philosophy, right? In the quantum information community, they start uh, really from the classical theory and they want to do a small step while um, um, in loop quantum gravity, you start from the nothingness of a non perturbative um, approach and you want to see space time emerge. So, um, first of all, to answer your question of uh, what is um, going on there, what do they mean? Uh, you can imagine that you have two boxes, two machines, uh, on which you put a clock. And this uh, clock, what it's going to do is that it's going to make available some operations, something that will happen to something that happens to go in that box, if it goes in that box, only at an instant of time. Right, so there's a clock, and this clock at whatever noon exactly for an infinitesimal amount of time will make available one operation. So I give somebody this box, which does operation A, I give somebody else another box that does operation B, also at a specific instant in time. And if that somebody can accomplish a task that uh, cannot be explained by A happening before B, or B happening before A, or a probabilistic mixture of those, then he must have had access to some uh, resource that uh, must, uh, for instance, they've shown that uh, the gravitational quantum switch that this can be superposition of space. But you cannot do it uh, in a classical space. So that's how it gets related with superposition of space and will go with quantum gravity somehow. And um, I think that where this comes from is the simple realization that a great survivor somehow of uh, relativity, where everything becomes relative, time, uh, and so on, space, 
is the event. Okay, so the event is not relativized. The event is the diffeomorphism variant concept in Einstein theory, in the sense of the interpretation that he attached to it, which is plain sense. Right? Diffeomorphism extends point to point. So if you define a point by a coincidence, that's it. This diffeomorphism variant. Now, of course, when you put quantum theories, it's going to become fuzzy and everything, but you don't really lose uh, this. Uh, and you will lose it as soon as you go to superpositional space time. So that's, um, yeah, I don't have uh, much more to say, but this is somehow the game that is being played here. Got it. Thank you. Can you pass uh, the microphone there? Hi, um, thanks for this session. I just wanted to follow up on Ognan's point earlier about um, what it means, uh, so following up from the earlier questions about what it means to have, you know, that A is causing B and, and B is causing A in the, in the causal models. Um, so I just want to say, um, in our latest work with um, Augustan, who's here, and uh, uh, Nick Omrod and, and, and John Barrett, um, similarly to Ognan's work, we, we have, uh, I think we, we've been able to make a very precise meaning uh, actually related to the previous discussion about tensor products, um, what it means for both these things to happen in, in, a, in a superposition. So, so if you look at these, if, if you draw a kind of uh, uh, directed graph uh, with cycles um, of, of all the nodes happening in, in a process with indefinite causal order, um, you can show actually how, how the, the different processes with different causal orders decompose into non-trivial combinations of direct sums and tensor products. And I think that this, this mathematical structure, this algebra of the non-triviality of how these tensor products and direct sums combine, uh, it really shows you how, how the superpositions of, of um, different causal orders are happening. And I suppose uh, maybe if in interesting uh, interest of this conference, it would be interesting to see if, if those superpositions of of uh, causal orders in, in the sense of a graph theoretic meaning can be somehow related to superpositions of, of actual space times uh, that would implement these causal orders. So I think that's a question that I would be very interested to see if, if some of the, the gravity people would have be able to tell us about. Uh, first, I don't know if Ojeda wanted to say anything, otherwise I yeah. so, uh, so I guess this is just a question to Maybe it's related to what Carla was asking, but uh, it's a question to be uh, about the, 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 the conceptual meaning of taking a superposition of space times, because uh, it's, a, it's a very sort of a Schrodinger sort of view. And typically, like if you're taking a superposition, what in, in quantum theory, what are the kinds of things you can take superpositions of? They typically have super associated observables. Uh, so what's the Heisenberg view of uh, superpositions of space times, like I, I don't know how to think of it. Uh, there's, I mean, yeah, so it's just an open question for. Does anybody want to uh, say something? Yeah, please. I mean, the question is what are the kinds of things you can take superpositions of? Typically, they're observables which have some eigenstates, and you can take superpositions. So, I don't know. Well, maybe I can say a word about this. In the sense that, uh, so there are, we have these two different frameworks in which we are. Uh, I'm, I'm coming back to the point that uh, Eugenio made uh, um, yesterday. It is the fact that we have uh, two different settings in which uh, we are considering uh, superpositions of space time. On one hand, we have the lab. I don't know if you were referring specifically to that. But on the other hand, in quantum gravity, superpositions uh, uh, of space times are our daily bread in the sense that uh, uh, the most natural states in the theories are not just uh, a state of a single geometry. They are uh, a superposition of different geometries. We can construct a coherent states that are a superposition of geometries that the results to be picked um, on some uh, specific geometries. So, and uh, in cosmology in particular, if you think of the early universe, when you think uh, about the processes uh, in which um, you can go from uh, one geometry to another one that are not connected by the classical solution of the Einstein equation, 
So this is possible in quantum gravity in the same way in which you can go from one side of a barrier to uh, another side. And, but in order to construct uh, uh, this process, you need to have uh, one solution and the other solution written in a unique state in a superposition. So for instance, you can have a, a, a contracting uh, space time with uh, an expanding uh, space time in the same state in a superposition. Then, of course, if you make a measurement uh, at a very early time or a very late time, so you, your measurement will correspond to only one of these two geometries, but nevertheless, you have these states that allows for tunneling processes and so on. So this could be true for cosmology, for the early universe cosmology. It could be true for uh, uh, the process uh, uh, that give rise to the evolution of a black hole from, say, a black hole into a white hole and so on. So, I mean, uh, concretely, in quantum gravity, we, have, we are always working with uh, those superpositions. Maybe, uh, well, <laughs> Carlo wanted to add something, and Pierre, and I wanted to close with Laurent because he has been <laughs> waiting for so long to speak, and then uh, it will be the closing of the session. So, please, be short so that we, everybody, all these people can speak. Okay. I, I, I think there are two different ideas what you mean the superposition. Are you going to answer in the theory? I write a theory, in the theory I write superposition of states. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you read Dirac, the, the superposition principle is the basis of quantum mechanics, given any state. They give any two states, there exists a... But I'm not sure this is the, the satisfactory answer here when, when we're asking what you mean by superposition of causal structure, because in the, 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 what do we mean that there is a superposition in the theory? It seems to me that the only meaning is that we see interference effect. No other meaning than that. So we say that the, super, the, the particle passes both holes, so it's a superposition of particles through one hole, superposition of other holes. It means only that given that we know the dynamic, if it passed through one hole, we would get some result A. If we passed through the other hole, we would get one result B. And we don't get neither A nor B, nor a certain probability of A, a certain probability of B. We get something else, which mathematically is just the, you know, the square of the sum of the amplitude, blah, 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 blah. So superposition is just a, a, a code theoretical work for interference. And interference is, a, I think, people who people agree with that. So that's why it's tricky to say what it means superposition space time, because uh, it's uh, the way I think about quantum mechanics is always, I mean, you can turn it around the way you want, but it's always preparation and measurement at the end of the day in, the, in one way or the other. So you prepare something and then you, you measure and you, so visual space time means that if you had one space time, you would see something. If you had the other space time, you see something from the dynamics and you see something else, which is related to the square of the amplitude of the sum of the two amplitudes. So, so you see, indirectly, that seems to me the, the core of the story. You see, very indirectly superposition all the time, all the time. The people who ask, why don't we see a superposition of a Schrodinger cat alive and, and, and wrong, in my opinion, don't, I have not understood quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics never tell you to see a superposition. You don't see superposition. You always see positions or momenta or whatever, or genes or, or, or geometry. It's how they are connected. The, 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 it's the fact that you assume that it always all this variable have a value and dynamic is respected, you go wrong. That's what superposition is. So I think if we talk about the visual causal structure, we should think in these terms. We should use, you say, what is the interference that comes about from the fact that uh, I can describe theoretically the fact that there is the one causal structure and also the other causal structure. Thank you, Carlo. I would like to entrust uh, the last uh, comment of this session to Loran. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I had a question. Maybe before, I just wanted, I think I like the challenge that was posed about formulating. So let, let, let me just try something here, you know, of the bat, which is, because um, I think it's a very important question. So, of course, if you ask, if you think about that question, you know, um, suppose that you have, you know, uh, in one space time A and B are causally connected, in the other one they are not. Then what is, what, you know, what, there's a fundamental axiom that we use in field theory 
all the time, which is micro-causality, which is essentially that if things are not causally connected, they commute. Okay, so, so if you try to have this formulation of what we mean to, to be in a, in a, in a um, superposition of space time, then you have to allow that this notion of micro-causality is not part of your foundation. So you would have to revisit a little bit, you know, what it means. And in fact, you know, there's many evidence that, in fact, if you include the constraints of GR, then you, 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 you know, you cannot rely on, on, on this micro-causality. But I think this, you know, trying to formulate that question, maybe going beyond, you know, the formalism, you know, you would have to question these questions of micro-causality, which, if you think for two minutes, everything we do relies on this one. So it might be interesting to, for philosophers or, or physicists to kind of uh, try to understand that a little bit better. Uh, I just wanted to conclude. There was a question I had. Uh, it was, in fact, there was one question for Emily, one for, uh, you know, another part of the talk, which which was about about time. It connects to to um, maybe the the first uh, uh, the first uh, discussion. So it came in 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 one of the slide of Alexander. He went very fast. He, he talked about physical clocks there, and and he showed that you know if you take a physical clock, there's something, and the physical clock has to be interacting with the system. Otherwise, you know, how would you even read something <laughs> out of it? And and he, he showed very in passant, en passant, that a physical clock has a, a memory. Like you know, if you if you read the time of physical clock, there was an integral over a propagator that depends on the past time and the past history of that time, and. So I was wondering whether people have thought about the fact that these this kind of memory effects, which is inherent to any physical system, and I'm saying that because um, this memory effect, you could say, oh, it's just because uh, Alexander is having a, a, a clock which is not perfect, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, as a GR person, what we're learning now when we measure LIGO effect is that, in fact, the positions of objects in space-time are subject to memories. So, so this is a very, very important physical effect that, that it, you know, the points in space-time, so the way we locate points in space-time cannot be decoupled from the history that happened in the past because anytime you have something happening, radiation is emitted, and this radiation which is emitted has a long tail effect, which is this memory. So I, I wanted to understand or ask people that are thinking about time quantum mechanically you know, how do we integrate the fact that physical clocks have memory, even in fact, space-time has memory, would that change their perspective a little bit? Thank, thank you, Laurent. I think uh, maybe this theme uh, will uh, come out uh, tomorrow again. And uh, I, I think we, can, we have to close at this point. I had uh, a number of people uh, uh, that wanted to talk, uh, uh, Ericsson, uh, Richard, I'm sorry, the discussion has been uh, so involving, so active. I'm very thankful. I wanted to thank also Sarayu and Jessica for helping going around the room. And thank you to everybody for contributing. And